have a good one. But hey, I'm here to introduce uh, my friend Richard Marshman, who's one of my favorite people. Um, he and I actually met in a place kind of like this. We met at a GDC talk. We cannot remember what the talk was about, um, but uh, we just kind of randomly started talking, you know. And at the time, I was I was just, I, I was either an aspiring game dev student or was teaching um, the, the very basic, most basic class at Austin Community College at the time. And, and we just struck a conversation. He had already been. The senior or lead designer on Gex and the Soul Reaper games, and uh, and we kind of hit it off. And we sort of talked at conferences from then on. Um, we reconnected when I was in graduate school, and he was working on the Uncharted series for Naughty Dog, where he was the lead or co-lead designer for the first three fantastic games. Um, and uh, and you know, in 2012, uh, while I was working for Tracy Fortune at USC, um, Richard came and joined us at USC. As, as a professor, and, uh, and we sort of, I guess, for a brief moment, switched roles where I was mentoring him a little bit. He actually took one of my uh, one of my game dev classes, um, and as a result of that, wrote the forward for, for my textbook. Um, and now he is uh, both an associate professor and the associate chair of the Interactive Media and Games Division at the University of Southern California um, School of Cinematic Arts. He has a degree in physics and philosophy from Oxford. He's a DJ, who has played a lot of awesome sets that I've seen, um, spoken many, many times at GDC and runs the GDC Micro Talks every year. And he's been the co chair of uh, the NDK Conference uh, a few times. Uh, and, uh, and he brings this sense of wonder and passion to his design that I really personally find inspiring. Um, he, I know he's passionate about this talk because I tried to get him to hang out with me a lot last week when I was in LA, and he only had one hour because he was working on this talk so much. And he's absolutely passionate about his teaching, and so I'm really excited to hear his ideas about game designing the game design class. So everyone, Richard Marshall. Well, thank you uh, so much for that uh, lovely introduction, Jeremy. I don't know whether it made my terrible nerves better or worse, oh, but I will try and no, live up to it. And thank you so much for your warm greeting, guys. It's really great to be here. So this is my friend, the game designer, Peter Britson. Uh, you probably know him here at Meaningful Play for his game, The Cat and the Coup, which is a documentary game about the downfall of Iran's last democratically elected prime minister. Uh, it's available for free on Steam if you want to have played it and want to check it out. I co-taught undergraduates with Peter for my first three and a half years at USC, and he was one of my most important teachers as I myself figured out how to teach. One day over lunch, soon after I joined USC, Peter wondered out loud, is the process of game development itself just like playing a game? He pointed out that game development, like a game, is almost always a process of exploration and discovery. You get oriented towards what you're doing, you start to map out the terrain, you uncover problems to solve, and you have to bring all of your ingenuity to bear on solving those problems. The more problems you solve in a game and in game development, the more progress you make. But that leads you to uncover new, unresolved, ever more difficult challenges. Furthermore, both, both processes can easily become tinged with obsession. Late at night, when you shouldn't be going to bed, you feel the tug of having one more go at finishing that level, or one more crack at fixing that bug that you're working on. At USC, we advise our students to stop at this point and go to bed, by the way. We all know, uh, in game playing, as in game development, you're much more likely to get to either the next level or to fixing that bug after a good night's sleep. But Peter's idea stayed with me as I went through the process of figuring out how to teach game design and development. If making a game is rather like playing a game, is teaching people how to make games like teaching people how to play a game? So I really like digital games that teach the player how to play them without too many overt tutorials, where the player can really just kind of mess around, try out the controls, figure out what they're meant to be doing. What if I could give my students a simple system of rules to play within 
letting them experiment playfully, try, fail, try again, and eventually master their craft. That seemed like something that perhaps I could figure out how to do. So as Jeremy said, my name is Richard Lamarchand, and I'm a game designer. Uh, I always feel a bit like I'm at a Game Designers Anonymous meeting when I say that. Um, and today I want to tell you a little bit about my career in the mainstream of the game industry, what led me to become a full-time professor at USC, and how I think my experiences in the game industry affected my practice both as a teacher and a game researcher. I'm interested in the tension between rules and playfulness in both teaching and game design, uh, as well as in, as in life in general. And I have a few thoughts for you that I hope will spur some further conversation. So thanks in advance for your feedback. I'm keen to hear what you think about this stuff. So um, I grew up in a small rural town in the west of England, and after a childhood spent drawing and writing and making my own toys and games, uh, as Jeremy said, I went away to college to do a degree in physics and philosophy. And it was that odd double major, combining both a science and a humanity, that undoubtedly helped me to get my first job as a game designer in 1991 uh, at the British wing of the American game studio Microprose. Uh, I cut my teeth working on the third ever real-time 3D game for the Sega Genesis, a pretty good claim to fame. Uh, and, uh, and I nurtured my passion for narrative action games by working on a, a couple of side-scrolling platforms. Tin Head was one of them, the other one went unpublished. My first game development mentors back then were the original generation of indie game developers. They were the bedroom programmers of uh, the British scene in the 1980s, uh, as well as a group of talented tabletop game designers who worked for play companies like TSR and Games Workshop. And I learned a huge amount from these folks. In 1995, I moved to Palo Alto in Northern California to work at Crystal Dynamics, where I helped to create games like Gex, Pandemonium, and the Soul Reaper series. So if Microprose had been my undergrad education in game development, then Crystal Dynamics was really like grad school. Uh, the dot-com boom was booming all around us, and the people I worked alongside were incredibly generous in teaching me everything I needed to know to become a Silicon Valley game designer. It was during this time that I met many of my future colleagues at Naughty Dog. I worked on two Gex games with future Naughty Dog president Evan Wells, uh, and one of them with Last of Us game director Bruce Straley. Uh, and I was also taken under the wing of game director Amy Hennig, who would go on to direct the Uncharted series. I found a kindred spirit in Amy. We were both fascinated by game making as a craft with untapped artistic possibilities. And we were both keen to find new ways to bring wider and deeper types of emotion to interactive storytelling. I learned so much from my colleagues at Crystal Dynamics about game engines and hardware, art, animation, and audio. But eventually, after nearly a decade of study in our metaphorical grad school, I graduated. And about six months after Amy had made the same move, I followed her down to Southern California to start work at Naughty Dog. Now, I joined the studio as a big fan of their Crash Bandicoot and Jack and Daxter games. And I got to work on the last two games in the Jack series. As we were working on Jack X, a small team had begun work on a project with the code name of Big. And I was lucky enough to be able to sit in on, on a lot of their brainstorming meetings. And eventually I became the lead game designer on the game that would finally become Uncharted Drake's Fortune, the first game in the Uncharted series. I went on to be the co-lead game designer on the other two PlayStation 3 Uncharted games. And I feel incredibly lucky to have been in on the ground floor of a game series like Uncharted. So they've been able to see firsthand how the world, the characters, and the gameplay of this series evolved over the course of the next seven years. And building these games was immensely challenging, as you can imagine. Not only did we have to change the way we told stories from the light-hearted American anime of the Jack games to the more, somewhat more mature contemporary pulp adventure of Uncharted, but we had to work out how to use the new hardware of the PlayStation 3 to create gameplay and production values more impressive than any that had been seen before, and for an audience with a very wide range of game experiences and tastes. I'm very happy to say that the Uncharted series was a big success for Naughty Dog and their parent company, Sony Computer Entertainment. And while Nathan Drake never quite seems to get the treasure that he's after, uh, we won an embarrassment of riches in terms So looking back across my career in the game industry, uh, it's interesting to me that the games I was lucky enough to work on kind of seem to recapitulate a historic shift uh, in digital games, uh, with hugely increased computational power and storage capacity, and the gameplay shift from 2D to 3D that that made possible. 
At the same time, team sizes grew from just two or three people of my first game to the two or three hundred people that it might take to make a large AAA game these days. And this often gives me pause to think about the way that our students come to game development in stages that might mirror my journey from 2D to 3D games, from smaller teams to larger teams. But while my journey took me 20 years, theirs takes place in just a few years, or maybe even a number of months. Now, I'm still trying to figure out how to make good use of that idea by putting myself in their shoes and trying to remember the order that I learned things in, uh, that made them make sense. You know, RGB and alpha channels, polygons and UV maps, rigging and keyframes, conditionals and while loops, and so on. But mainly this thought drives me to try and hold on to my beginner's mind. You know, to try and remember what it's like to be piecing together the bigger conceptual map of game development from a territory that you only partially understand. Anyway, I had an amazing time at Naughty Dog, and I wouldn't trade that experience for anything. Um, but as my 20th year in the game industry approached, I began to think about possibly making a change of career direction. Uh, over the course of my time at Naughty Dog, I've become more and more involved with the emerging independent game scene mainly through my volunteer work for NDK, the Independent Festival of Independent Games. I've been putting influences from indie and art games into my work on the Uncharted series uh, for a while, most famously in the Peaceful Village sequence in Uncharted 2, which was partly inspired by Tale of Tales game, The Graveyard. The people that I met in the indie scene had this hunger for innovation in games. Uh, they often had a socially progressive outlook, and had a set of artistic interests and influences that I found really inspiring. Soon after I joined Naughty Dog, sorry Tracy, uh, I had reconnected with Tracy Fullerton, uh, who I'd first met at my very first GDC some 10 years earlier. Tracy, uh, as you probably know, is the director of the USC Games Program. She's the director of the USC Game Innovation Lab, and she is the chair of our division of the School of Cinematic Arts, the Interactive Media and Games Division, or IMGD, and she's here with us today. Um, she's a very talented game designer, soon to release her latest game, Walden. I believe that you'll be able to play it tonight. Um, it's based on the work of Henry David Thoreau, uh, and she's also the author of Game Design Workshop, which I'm sure many of the professors among you use in your game design classes. I consider myself extremely lucky to know you, Tracy. Uh, and as you guys will soon see, Tracy is hugely responsible for the fact that I'm standing here in front of you today. So through reconnecting with Tracy, I learned more about the USC Games program and the work being done there. I was tremendously impressed by the way that the USC program had developed strong, productive relationships with the game industry, giving students the skills that they would need to find good jobs in the existing industry. But what really turned my head was the emphasis Tracy and her colleagues were putting on innovation in game design and on the advancement of games as a cultural form. Even more than preparing people to work in the game industry as we know it, the goal of the USC Games program is to graduate students that will go on to become tomorrow's game industry leaders, opening up new styles of gameplay, new subject matter, uh, and whole new genres and marketplaces for games. The USC Game Innovation Lab that Tracy founded really led this charge, uh, which so many others are now following, and provided a home to some of our best known alumni, including Genova Chen and Kelly Santiago, who would go on to found that game company and ultimately revolutionize the game industry with their 2012 Game of the Year journey. So I began volunteering at USC while working at Naughty Dog, visiting to give talks, and later becoming a game industry mentor to several of the IMGD MFA students in their third year thesis projects. I think it was the zeal with which I approached these mentorship duties that made Tracy think I might be an okay teacher. Uh, I later found out that most of the industry mentors would meet with their mentees maybe a few times a semester, but I was scheduling weekly meetings, making my students bring me builds of their games every Saturday for review, and asking them to draw up schedules with their alpha Beta milestones uh, on them, poor folks. Uh, all worked out, all right, yeah. uh, and, but of course, I really enjoyed working with these brilliant young people, and it turned out that all of the skills of design critique and project management uh, that I used at Naughty Dog were directly transferable to supervising student work. I've often said since I joined USC that my work at the university isn't so different from my work in the game industry. 
where for most of my career I've worked collaboratively with less experienced game designers to teach them the tools that we were using and to onboard them with our games design and to game design best practices more generally. And I'm still doing that in essence, except that now my game design mentees are just that little bit green. So when I began to think about change of career, I went to Tracy for advice. Uh, she, she suggested that there might be a role for me at the School of Cinematic Arts. And it soon became obvious to me that working alongside Tracy and the amazing faculty, staff, and students of USC Games was an opportunity that I simply couldn't miss. Uh, I started working full-time at USC in the fall of 2012 as uh, an associate professor. And I, as Jeremy said, I'm now also the associate chair of our division. I remain tremendously grateful to Tracy for making it possible for me to become a professor of game design. It's one of the best things that has ever happened to me, so thank you, Tracy. So my introduction to the Academy was fantastic. I immediately started having fun, and I haven't stopped since. Uh, many of the classes that I've taught have been intermediate level courses in the three related disciplines of game design, game development, and game production, uh, teaching both undergraduates and MFA students and with a handful of PhD candidates in the mix as well. I've always been a hands-on, like an implementing game designer, uh, not just a concept person. Uh, even in my role as a lead, I was able to stay hands-on. And so teaching design and development, you know, the business of coming up with ideas and then actually building and programming the game in the game engine, that came fairly naturally to me. It's my belief that game designers are the neurotransmitters of a game team. They shuttle between all of the other artisans, programmers and artists, animators and audio folks, facilitating communication across the sometimes cultural divides of these different disciplines, uh, gathering up great game design ideas wherever they find them and collating them into a co coherent whole of the game's design. In order to be able to do this well, I think the game designers should know how to do a little bit of everything. They should have opened every tool and mucked around in it at least once so that they can have more intelligent conversations with their peers in these different fields. Now that outlook has stood me in good stead at USC, mainly because of the practice, the practice focused nature of our program. Very many of our classes achieve their pedagogic goals through hands-on game building. We're big believers that getting a group of students together, having them roll up their sleeves and mucking in together to build something is the very best way to engage their learning faculties, as I'm sure you've found as well whether it's around game design, project management, or leadership and collaboration. However, I only use proprietary game engines at Naughty Dog and Crystal Dynamics, and so when I got to USC, I set about beginning to teach myself how to use the game engine Unity 3D. I did okay, uh, especially with some help from my grad student, Julia Cantor, uh, with Unity's online documentation. But in my second semester, I did something that transformed both my teaching practice and my ability to make games on my own. Formally enrolled, I went to the enrollment office, I formally enrolled in a USC class called Introduction to Game Development, taught by Professor Jeremy Gibson Bond, uh, who you met earlier. Now, those of you who know Jeremy, who used to work at USC and who now teaches here at Michigan State, know what a great game developer and teacher he is. Uh, Jeremy's class had a truly transformative effect on me. It not only took me from being a Unity dabbler to an intermediate level Unity developer, but it also turned me into a programmer. I've done a lot of scripting in my industry career in a variety of languages, but it wasn't until I took Jeremy's class that I really had the confidence to call myself a fully fledged programmer. And I will forever be grateful to you, Jeremy, for helping me earn those stripes. Uh, if you guys also want to benefit from Jeremy's teaching skills, I highly recommend picking up a copy of his book, Introduction to Game Design Development, uh, Prototyping and Development, uh, which as Jeremy said, I also wrote the forward, forward for in the interest of full disclosure. Jeremy, this utterly shameless plug is my way of thanking you. Thank you very much. So as a side note here, I would heartily encourage you to do what I did taking Jeremy's class, if you're able. In our academic lives, where we are all always so busy, uh, I know it can be very hard to carve out the time to focus on our own ongoing education. But in a field like ours, which changes so quickly, I think that taking a class here and there is a good way of staying current, of continuing to grow as a person, 
and of remaining excited and inspired by our work. Uh, I think that taking a class can even be a kind of self-care. The time that I spent in Jeremy's class gave me a creative out outlet and kind of a calm caught in a storm uh, as I came up to speed as a teacher. It was a somewhat stressful time. Uh, and of course it continues to pay me dividends in terms of the prototypes and games that I'm now able to make thanks to your help, Jeremy. Just a little food for thought. So alongside design and development, the third strand of my intermediate classes is game production. At Naughty Dog, I had production duties as well as design duties, and I'd always thought a lot about best practices for game production. I think this is an aspect of game development that has tremendous room for improvement in both the industry and the academy. I think that game production approaches, the game production approaches we use and teach, are often either too bureaucratic, uh, they can bog us down with uh, unnecessary processes that can, that can waste our time, or they swing too far in the other direction, and then we become too unstructured, missing opportunities to help us keep our projects on time, on budget, and on track to high quality gameplay and production values. At Naughty Dog, we tried to strike a balance between just enough structure and a kind of think on your feet pragmatism. And my colleagues have welcomed my bringing this same kind of approach to USC. I'll come back to this topic later on in my talk because I think it relates not just to the employability of our students, but also to their physical and psychological well-being. So, as well as these intermediate classes, I've also been lucky enough to teach an experimental game design class that is a capstone for undergrads, uh, an elective for MFAs and PhDs. Um, this class is my favourite thing of the year, pretty much. It's tremendous fun to teach, and I was lucky to be given free reign in devising the service to draw on my personal influences and interests, everything from beat literature cut-ups and surrealist games to Yoko Ono's book Grapefruit, uh, to live-action role-playing, from Porpentine to Tale of Tales. And the class has become quite successful, and I was tremendously proud when the young man on the right there, standing on the right, uh, Will Helworth, won Best Student Game in the Independent Games Festival with his project, Close Your, that began life in this class. Teaching this class dovetailed with my other major role at U uh, in the USC Games program, aside from teaching admin and service, uh, which is, of course, research. Now, for me, Tracy, and many of our colleagues across the School of Cinematic Arts, Research means making creative work and then reflecting on the discoveries we made during the course of its creation in papers, chapters, or books. I knew early on that in my life after Naughty Dog, I wanted to make small, strange, personal, and experimental games uh, in, based out of the USC Game Innovation Lab, uh, which I had admired for so long. And while it took me quite a while to kind of get my personal creative practice started, I finally found my feet with a virtual reality art installation game that we finished earlier this year. It's called The Meadow, and it's the first game that I finished making uh, since we shipped Uncharted 3. Uh, it's a co-creation with IMGD MFA alumnus and current uh, IMGD staff member Marty Campos, uh, with a bunch of help from a talented team of student volunteers from across our program. Uh, and I'm honored to say our game was a finalist in last year's Indie. I won't tell you more about it for now, but I'd love to chat with you guys uh, later this week about your own explorations in experimental game design. So that's the journey that brought me here to you today. Uh, it's been a really wonderful path. I'm very grateful, like I say, to Tracy and to all my colleagues in our program from whom I've learned so much. And I didn't realize until I started teaching how true the old cliche is about how much a teacher learns from their students. That's certainly been true for me, uh, and so I'm grateful to our students too. So for the rest of my time with you today, I'd like to talk about some of the things I've learned since joining USC from the perspective of a AAA game developer turned teacher of game design. But first, I want to do something uh, kind of inspired by Will Wright and the Russian Space Minute that he used to do about his talk. I always forget to drink water uh, when I'm giving a talk, so I'm going to do that now. Yes? You know what the next slide is, don't you? Yeah. 
Jesus. And so that's the end of that public service. <laughs> <laughs> So what is it like to take a class designed and run by a game designer? Are the classes playful, fun, or silly? Are they bound by rules, points, and scores? Do they present tutorials disguised by drama, carefully planned onboarding, and a rising curve of challenge? Can they hold the ambiguity of the seemingly opposing poles we find in life between the quantifiable and the measurable, and the qualitative, qualitative the subjective, the ineffable? In the midst of a particularly challenging crunch time in the first half of my career, when my colleagues and I were working 60, 70, 80 hours a week in response to project calamities and ever-shifting deadlines, and when work on our game at the time was really not very much fun at all, I came across a, fa a phrase while reading online attributable to Sid Meier, a founder of Microprose, the company that gave me my start in the industry. The phrase struck me like a bolt from the blue, and I clung to it like a piece of flotsam in the deluge. The simple phrase was, you have to have fun to make fun. Now, this idea gained quite a bit of currency among game designers at the time. It's describing something rather like the old alchemical principle of as above, so below. The idea is that if the developers who are making the game are having a good time, then the game that they're making is likely to be invested with their positive feelings, uh, just by dint of their playful attitude, uh, their attunement to the mechanics and narrative of their game, and their increased passion in finessing all, the, all of the nitpicky little details that make something really excellent. I like to think of it as a kind of method acting for game designers. And having thought a lot about art games over the past few years, it seems very clear to me that, especially for small teams, the personalities of the game creators very much come through in the work, whatever those personalities might be, uh, even if the game isn't fun in a conventional way, or isn't fun at all. Cleaving to this principle, from the very beginning I was determined to bring a playful attitude to my teaching, in every sense that I could think to apply the concept of, of playfulness. Of course, this could have gone horribly wrong. Uh, if I gamified my classes in the wrong way, treating my students as game-playing customers to be entertained and accommodated, uh, I, instead of as scholars to be illuminated and challenged, I could have ended up with easy courses and little learning. Instead, I've tried to create classes that are intentionally designed as interactive experiences centered around my students' learning, where their active participation and meaningful choices lead them to interesting outcomes that show them new things about making, about the world, and ultimately, about themselves. So this is not to say that I'm necessarily the funnest teacher that my students will have ever had. Uh, to be honest with you, I don't think that's the case. My classes are known for being rather tough. I set high expectations for my students, and I work hard on my classes in a way that models an expectation that my students will work hard too. Now, hopefully you can pick up from my talk today that I'm someone who cares a lot about what I do. I'm also a bit silly, a bit goofy, uh, even if it's tempered with a dash of English reserve. <laughs> and I think that for me, my lightness of tone and enthusiasm, mixed with the way that I actually take game making very seriously, help me to create a healthy atmosphere in the classroom, where students can kind of relax into the work, opening up into being their authentic selves, and all the while being bold enough to be able to risk making mistakes. As Dr. Stuart Brown said in his Meaningful Play talk just this very morning, risk, purpose, and meaning, and a sense of authenticity are tied very deeply into the play nature. But I'm also interested in having my students not get too comfortable, remaining just a little bit on edge, caring enough to bring their A game and avoiding becoming Finding this edge between comfort and nervousness, between caring desperately and letting go, is the first of several tensions, even possible contradictions, that I want to present you with today, and which I think are at the heart of a playful attitude in teaching, whether it's in game design or in any other discipline. At USC, as I am sure you do too, we place great emphasis on systems thinking. Tracy has a great exercise in her class that asks students to deconstruct the system of an object, uh, or maybe 
a set of objects. In terms of their affordances, it might be something like a toy traffic light or a, a board game or a set of game pieces, but without the rules. Getting students to think in terms of systems of interconnected elements whose relationships are governed by rules and the relationship that those systems have uh, with the ideas and feelings of audiences are clearly a huge part of priming the field for great game design. For my part, I'm a huge fan of Donella H. Meadows, uh, who is now sadly deceased, uh, and her book, Thinking in Systems of Primal. I've used this book in my grad school class a couple of times, and it's a wonderfully clear introduction to the world of systems dynamics, the academic discipline that studies everything from economics and ecosystems to social policy and geopolitics. Dana, as she was known to her friends, talks about the mind-boggling complexity even the simplest of systems, in a way that speaks to me very strongly as a game designer. She created this kind of system diagram where we can see the flow of resources back and forth in a system, typically in relationships governed by feedback loops. It might be the stabilizing feedback of a thermostat or the runaway feedback of compound interest in a bank account. Because of the emergent complexity of even the simplest system I always had an emphasis in my work in the industry on what Tracy calls play-centric design. And this is an approach to game design that prioritizes playtesting very highly, beginning right at the very start of the project with the use of paper prototyping and other kinds of radical design strategies, and continuing throughout the implementation of the game with both informal and formal playtests that keep designers very closely in touch with the way that their work is landing with their audience of players. We ran 210 players through formal playtests for Uncharted 3. And now I get my students playtesting from almost the very first class meeting of the semester and every single week throughout the semester. This kind of approach to game development is analogous, I think, to the human-centered design approach pioneered by the design and consulting firm Ideal who bring end users of whatever product they're designing into the design process very early, seeking out the hidden assumptions and the nuggets of design gold that lie in wait in the minds and experiences of everyday people. So if a video game is a system of software and hardware, images and sounds, controllers and computation, set up in a feedback loop with the system of a player and their perceptions, thoughts, feelings and, and actions, so too is a class, a system of students and instructor, syllabus and assignments, classroom and class times. In the system of the game and the system of the class uh, might come all of the characteristics that we love about the best games. Depth, emergence, systemic richness, interestingness, meaningful choices. So I think about the feedback loops of the class. For example, I'm constantly in search of the best division of class times between lectures, exercises, breakout groups, and class-wide discussions. I'm also always exploring for the best way for my students to give me feedback about um, my work, as well as, uh, um, uh, oh, I messed up here. So yeah, I'm looking for a balance between these things. I'm always exploring for the best ways for me to give my students feedback about their work, as well as for them to give me feedback about I used to give a lot of written feedback, um, uh, you know, paragraphs and paragraphs of feedback. But now I've shifted my priorities and structured my classes so that I can give more feedback in person, uh, in class time or, or maybe in office hours, so that I can see firsthand whether I'm being clearly understood, uh, so that my students have a, a chance to offer me follow-up questions, and perhaps most importantly, so that I can see when a piece of constructive criticism uh, which I intend kindly, lands badly from an emotional point of view of the student, uh, making them put up their defences. In that moment, uh, I can kind of guide them through receiving the feedback in such a way that they can hear what I'm truly trying to say. Dana Meadows also talks about the counterintuitive behaviour of systems and the importance of intuition and holistic thinking when we're trying to understand the system. In a section towards the end of her book, she says, Let's face it, the universe is messy. It's non-linear, turbulent, and dynamic. It spends its time in transient behavior on its way to somewhere else, not in mathematically neat equilibrium. It self-organizes and evolves. It creates diversity 
and uniformity. That's what makes the world interesting, that's what makes it beautiful, and that's what makes it work. So I love this tension at second of the afternoon between order and messiness, between comprehensibility and counterintuitiveness, in the systemic character of both game design and teaching. It's what makes game development both a science and an art, and it's why we should expect the unexpected in the systems of our classes and our games. The fact that play arises from within systems of rules is a theme that runs throughout Katie Salen and Eric Zillman's groundbreaking game studies work, Rules of Play. In a game, rules create a framework within which we express our agency through action, either for competitive or maybe for purely playful ends. In a class, rules create a social contract about the working space, setting and managing expectations around trying and failing safely, uh, which I believe is the only path to excellence in creative work. That will resonate with any of you who have read uh, Ed Campbell's book, Creativity in Ink, which is really excellent. The question of how to establish rules in a class was where the algorithm devising, number crunching game designer really, really kicked in. Each of my class syllabi reads a little bit like the player handbook for a game design Dungeons and Dragons campaign, with my graded assignments perhaps as modules in the adventure. Uh, I use the syllabus to lay out the rules and the learning goals of the game that is the class, and studying the syllabus is my students' first assignment. I go over the most important rules in the first class meeting, of course, including everything from the importance of punctuality for professionalization and common courtesy, uh, to my advice about the classroom as a safer space, where we can be our authentic selves and expect to be received with respect and consideration. I'm always looking for ways to professionalize my students, and the hoops I'm able to jump through as they turn in their assignments are intended to get them thinking about communication, about taking small details seriously, and about staying oriented in the ways, uh, to the ways in which they impact others, either interpersonally uh, or through their work. I think that being clear with students about the rules of the class is a really good way to win their trust by letting them know that I'm going to be dedicated to keeping us all on the same page in the community of the class. At the end of the day, I think that just as rules make a game possible, rules in the classroom are supportive, giving students a framework or structure to orient themselves towards and work within, and to occasionally push back against. I like it when that happens, which, because it always transforms then both the working environment and the work. I try to ensure the way that I enforce the rules isn't patronizing, and I go out of my way to be collegial and warm and friendly, even if I'm pointedly welcoming a late arriver to class, a trick I learned from you, Tracy. I think that there's lots more I could do in structuring my classes to draw out this classroom as a design game experience, and I consider I'm only just at the beginning of figuring, out this, figuring this out. I'm fascinated by Mark Kahn's book, Minds on Fire, uh, which is about his use of role playing and competitive social play in his reacting to the past history classes at Barnard College. Anyway, this tension between freedom and rules, between trust and negotiation, is yet another great one for us to hold in our quest for answers about how to design well, how to teach well. Oh, here we go. Season 3, Black Mirror, on Netflix tomorrow. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Black Mirror will almost certainly need a content warning, uh, several different kinds of content warning. I warn you, hope you like it. Thank you very much. So soon after I became a teacher, I read some of the work of the educator and activist Bell Hooks. In Teaching to Transgress, Hooks says that a class that is also a creative environment can easily become one-sided, maybe even oppressive, if the instructor, instructor doesn't enter the class with the same degree of vulnerability as her students, who, of course, are being asked to expose their innermost thoughts and feelings to scrutiny in the form of their work. This resonated very strongly with me as I figured out how to teach, and so I've always tried to model this in my classes. I have to tell you that it has never backfired. On the occasions when I've screwed up in class, I haven't become defensive or tried to save face, I've simply apologized in a heartfelt way uh, and moved on. When it's contextually relevant to someone's work, uh, I bring emotional experiences that I've had into class. 
I'm careful not to divulge inappropriately, of course, but I haven't been shy about speaking, say, to the struggle with depression that I faced in my teens and twenties, uh, or about a time when I experienced a bad breakup or a career low point. And most recently, I've made myself vulnerable to my students about the content of my classes. I've come clean with them that my classes are works in progress, and I tell them when I'm trying something new, and I'm not entirely sure it's going to work. Heck, I even tell them at the beginning of the first class meeting of each semester uh, that I am nervous as anything, standing up and speaking to them, uh, a group of relative strangers for the first time. And I've seen the shyest students in class immediately <laughs> begin to relax when I've done that. But it wasn't Bell Hooks who originally uh, got me thinking about vulnerability. It was Amy Hennig, who speaks movingly about the way that she works in, in her writing and game design to show the human vulnerability of each of the characters that she writes. Storytelling is a process of revealing and resolving small mysteries of the human character, as we get glimpses of the ways in which we each struggle with our hopes, desires, and fears. Trying to manage them as we meet each other in our relationships, and either building defensive walls between us, or coming closer together by making ourselves available and vulnerable to one another in our ideas and feelings. I believe very strongly that an awareness of interpersonal boundaries and the possibility of setting and negotiating boundaries in a deliberate way allows us to reach greater heights in our storytelling, in our game design, and in our teaching. The balance that we find when we maintain an interpersonal boundary at just the right distance between teacher and student, between designer and player, is yet another tension for us to hold. The setting and maintaining of interpersonal boundaries relates to some of the most important work I did as a game designer, uh, especially as a lead game designer, which I now bring to my classes. That is how we collaborate, communicate, and resolve conflicts, all of which impact our ability to lead teams or to help lead them. The challenge of keeping a cool head in the midst of the complex, technical, creative work we do as media makers, whether we're creating games, animation, feature films, TV and documentaries, is at the very heart of the teaching philosophies of all of the divisions of the School of Cinematic Arts, not just IMGD. The focus that all of my colleagues across our school put on teaching students how to play nicely together as they work together well is summarized by this quote from USC Cinematic Arts alumnus the Oscar-winning editor and sound designer Walter Murch. Half the job is doing the job, and the other half is finding out ways to get along with people and tuning yourself in to the delicacy of the situation. I was very fortunate to have quite a bit of exposure to various kinds of leadership training during my time in the game industry, and the lessons I learned in those sessions really proved invaluable to me in the classroom. Whether it's simple stuff like learning to use the famous uh, criticism and compliment sandwich to give constructive criticism in a way that can be heard, or more complex issues like dealing with conflict, de-escalating bad feelings, reopening channels of communication between people who have fallen out. It's my belief that we should uh, bring the soft skills of collaboration and leadership to the fore in all of our academic games programs. The lessons we learn when we deliberately develop our communication and collaboration skills yield benefits far beyond the workplace. And I'm excited to hear from you folks later about the way that you approach these subjects. For now, I just want to recommend uh, Mary Scannell's big book of conflict resolution games, whose exercises are easy to use in most any game class. My students really love them, and ever since I've been using this book, I've seen a dramatic decrease in the number of poor project outcomes related to interpersonal struggles between teammates. Simply bringing up the subject of conflict seems to give people the permission to work to resolve it in a better, healthier way. So before I wrap up, I want to briefly touch on the tremendous value that I see in theory and research. I've always understood the importance of digging deeply into a subject in order to unearth good ideas that lead towards a great game. My early mentors drummed into me the importance of, uh, of research and analysis, uh, whether it's of the general history of games, of games in the genre, or of narratives connected to our story world, but in other forms, like films or novels, or even poetry. And of course, the crucial importance of research based in the real world, a subject that I know is dear to the hearts of everyone here in the meaningful play community. 
The importance of research was true for the Soul Reaver games, which were influenced by everything from Zelda Link to the Past and Mario 64 to Milton's Paradise Lost, uh, T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, and German Expressionist cinema like The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. And it was true for the Uncharted games, which are influenced by a whole history of adventure stories and pulp fiction, from Treasure Island and King Solomon's Mines to Raiders of the Lost Ark. We were always keen for Uncharted to be rooted in real history, so that when you Google some aspect of the game's deep backstory, you find it to be true, probably, grounding the game's fantastical fiction in our real world, uh, making it ever more credible, and maybe even kindling your curiosity uh, about history more broadly. And research doesn't just yield narrative ideas for games, of course. It's also a valuable source of gameplay. Amy Pennig would watch countless hours of black and white adventure movies, making a note on a yellow legal pad every time that someone ran down a corridor or vaulted over a log, every time a punch was thrown or an enemy turned into an ally. And these lists of actions that she mounted on dozens of curled pages of yellow legal pad turned directly into the lists of the game mechanics in the Uncharted games. But equally as important as research is theorization. Just as cinematic, crea cinematic creativity took leaps forward with the great Russian film theorists like Lev Kuleshov and the Cahiers du Cinema critics that became the new wave directors. So I've watched game design begin to accelerate, diversify, and bloom in response to the work of Janet Murray, Mary Flanagan, Jesper Yule, Anna Anthropy, and all of the great thinkers about games whose work we enjoy. Reflective and critical theorization helps us to avoid repeating the mistakes of those who came before us, and it bootstraps us into new game design territory. Over and over again, new thinking about games has led to new game styles social games and mobile games, to the rise of our house games like Gone Home and Virginia. Critical perspectives and database research are crucial to game development in both the industry as well as the academy. And whether it's theoretical work, evidence-based experimental research, or avant-garde art-making practice, I love that the work that you all do leads to new experiences for new, more diverse audiences. And it's going to lead to whole new genres of games, probably whole new industries. So thank you for your work, fellow members of the Academy. It has tremendous value. I'm sure that many of you are aware of the problem of crunch in the game industry. Crunch is the word that game developers use to refer to the time in a project where the team is working late nights and weekends, maybe seven days a week, to get the game finished. This usually happens towards the end of a project, but people sometimes start crunching in the middle, maybe even all the way at the beginning of a game's creation. I'm a big believer in the value of hard work and sustained effort, but uncontrolled crunch takes a terrible toll. It harms the physical and mental health of the people who do it for more than a few weeks at a time. It damages organizations by creating poor morale and causing great staff to leave. And ultimately, it harms the games themselves, which end up being made by exhausted people with correspondingly poor decision-making capabilities. My friend Matthew Burns once said that he's concerned that the way that universities teach game development might accidentally contribute to this harmful practice. He said that he often sees student teams overscope the games they make in school. They plan a game that is too big. And then they run into time trouble later, and then they have to crunch like mad at the end. Matthew said, the students then graduate from their program thinking that this is the way that you make games. And they aren't surprised when the exact same thing happens at their studio, because they haven't had the opportunity to make games any other way. Different teachers have different uh, philosophies about how to teach students to scope their projects. And project scope is such a hard issue to get a handle on. Even seasoned game developers often find it almost impossible to anticipate how long something is going to take to implement. And I think that many game professors throw up their hands at the challenge of helping students match their dreams to what they can feasibly achieve. Believing that maybe if they just go through the process largely on their own, then they'll just figure it out as they go along. But and as Tracy has reminded me at regular intervals throughout my teaching career, true learning 
Indeed, any kind of personal growth is almost always accompanied by some struggle. But I'd encourage you, if you teach practical game development classes, not to delay in helping students scope their projects well. Don't just give them the full focus of your attention towards the end of their practical projects. Give it to them at the beginning, uh, as their ideas emerge, and in the middle, when it's becoming clearer how quickly or slowly they're moving to implement those ideas. As I mentioned earlier, at the core of the classes that I teach USC is a production methodology that I've devised based on my experiences with the Cerny Method approach used at Naughty Dog and Insomniac, and on my exposure to the Agile method of software development. I've managed to show in the classes that I taught with Peter and in my graduate student classes that a simple framework of regular milestones just spaced evenly throughout the project can allow students to plan their time in a way that mitigates crunch and still leads to great polished games finished on time. These milestones I use gradually but firmly get students to commit to decisions that lead to ever clearer project scope uh, with the right decision at just the right time uh, and based on the unique speed which they in their team constellations can get work done. It takes some extra work on my, uh, on my part to administer this framework, but we've seen from the positive outcomes that we've got with it that it's worth it. And with Tracy's support, we're now adopting this methodology uh, right across our program. Uh, I don't have time to go into more detail today, but I've started writing about this process and would love to discuss it with you throughout the remainder of the week. The problem of crunch is not an easy thing to get a handle on, as many academics, not just industry people, can attest. But we must try our hardest to help our students in this matter. And it's simply one more tension for us to hold. For teachers, for our students, and for game developers. The tension between our desire to work passionately hard and our desire not to harm ourselves with overwork. Towards the end of Thinking in Systems, Dana Meadows quotes the author G.K. Chesterton saying, the real trouble with this world of ours is not that it is an unreasonable world, nor even that it is a reasonable one. The commonest kind of trouble is that it is nearly reasonable, but not quite. Life is not an illogicality, yet it is a trap for logicians. It looks just a little more mathematical and regular than it is. Over the course of my teaching, I've come to understand that perhaps the most important part of my job is to show my students how to tolerate a contradiction, how to hold the tension, of opposing opposites. I'm a rather literal minded person, and sometimes trying to reconcile opposing ways of thinking gives me a does not compute moment. Uh, there we go. I occasionally even begin to panic about this, believing that I should always have a clear and unquestionably correct answer for my students. How can I be credible as a professor if I don't have all the answers? But holding attention, uh, a contradiction, or an ambiguity like this is a radical. It's an essential act, and it's a fundamentally playful act. As Carl Jung reminds us, it's a source of energy. I've eventually come to believe that it's the questions we ask our students, not the answers we give them, that provide them with true value. It's the real talk about the real problems of game development that we bring to the table, and the authenticity and vulnerability that we show our students that are the engines of real learning. To do that in a genuine way, we each of us have to find our own ways to hold the tensions and ambiguities of life itself, of both game design and of teaching game design, with courage, with humor, and with hope. Uh, I hope that you'll agree that it's a beautiful struggle. I can't wait to carry on talking to you uh, about all of this and the unfolding conversations here at Meaningful Play, and to continue to learn from you all. Thanks so much for your time this afternoon and a rather long talk. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, my talk was rather long. I don't know if we have the time.